The monad, according to Pythagoras, is the one in terms of the total or the all. The monad is different, therefore, from the unit. And there is this same difference as between unity and unit. A unit is one. A unity is one. But the unit is a one separate or dissimilar from other things. A unity is a one which is a total of all other things in itself. Therefore, the monad is the one in the terms of wholeness. It is the one in the terms of that to which there can be no second, any time, anywhere. But there can be no duality involving two totalities. The Greeks at an early day of their thinking came to the realization that the root of existence lay in a one for which there was no two. And how to explain this and to discover it rested with Pythagoras. He said, certainly we have diversity. We have number. We have many. We say many from one. But let us follow the Greek thought and say many in one. Because in the Greek concept, the primary monad is never divided. It may allow or permit a certain division within itself, but of its own nature it is always forever one. All the confusion and <coughs> diffusion of life, things scattered to innumerable extremes and extremities, still must bear witness to the fact that the one is undivided. This one, therefore, is a kind of total in which all things exist substantially and essentially. And to this one, which is the primal or eternal monad, the Greeks assigned the concept of God. Anyone who assumes that the Greeks were not aware of one deity is mistaken. All you have to do is read your Plato and Socrates to know that this is not so. For well, they were fully aware of the existence of one deity. The difficulty lay in the fact that they were so aware of this mystery that they declared it profitless to attempt to explain it. That this totality is best understood and best conceived if we make no effort to interpret it. The mere fact that it represents totality or unity or holiness is as far as we can go. For the moment we go further, we must take away something. If we say that it has any attributes, we are immediately denying that it has certain other attributes. For if we say it is tall, then we say it is not short. If we say it is old, then we say it is not new. If we say it was begotten, then we must say that it can end. Therefore, any way in which we attempt to define it must deprive it of some of its attributes. So the concept of monad, or totality, was perhaps not an incorrect one uh, for the primary of Greek thinking. This primary they regarded, therefore, as all-inclusive. Everything that could exist anywhere, not only in this solar system, but in the most abstract dimensions of cosmos, both quantitative and qualitative, qualitative, not only on this line of the continuum, but on any other line of the continuum. All these things that exist, have existed, or may exist at some future time, and all things in the process of transition from one state to another state, moving from that which is known toward that which is unknown, all the reverse. All these things abide as attributes of monadal unity. Nothing can be a surprise. Nothing can be new. Nothing can come from nothing. Nothing can go to nothing. Everything eternally is. Conditions change. Principles do not change. A thing which appears to disappear merely retires from an objective to a subjective state, but its substance is not different. Anything which appears appears to come from nowhere, but nothing can come from nowhere. Therefore, space, or emptiness, as we know it, cannot be space and it cannot be empty. Actually, therefore, we live within a total monadal substance, of which its primary attribute, cognizable to us, is infinite potential. There is no limit to what it can be. There is no way of measuring what it has been. There is no way of solving, really, what it is. 